I'm so glad that so many of you are smiling and excited and happy and that you guys are just feeling better today. Don't you all just feel better now? Because this whole, your whole week and this whole world and all of life we're surrounded in a world of people who try to gain their own honor for their own glory and their own praise. But just today, what we did is we fulfilled what Scripture said, and that is to outdo one another. And so I hope that this last moment wasn't about you, but in you giving honor to others, you feel greater fulfilled. And... And I guess during this period, we found out who the most humble person in our congregation was, right, Corbin? <laughs> Corbin came up and told his dad he was the greatest person ever, so, essentially. So, but keep on honoring each other. We're going to be starting on a new series, really talking about the Bible and the home. And this is really important because when we really think about our faith, when we think about the Word of God, when we think about who we want to save, ultimately we often think of our families. We think about our spouses, we think about our kids, we think about our relatives, and so forth. But one of the things that has been one of the hardest questions that I have been asked in my ministry life is a question that so many of you have asked, and maybe a lot of you, have, and actually a lot of you have even asked me this question, and that's, what happened? What happened? This is one of the questions that I stay awake a lot thinking about, and I've, been, I've spent really my years of ministry really trying to study this question and study the answer to what happened. And what, what this context of this question is, is they often ask, what happened to my loved ones, especially my kids? What happened to people who have fallen away from Christ and the church? What happened? Have you ever asked that question before? I know a lot of people have asked that question. And to tell you the truth, I hear that this is probably one of the most common questions I get asked. And it's one of the hardest answers I have to think about and dwell on. And I, and I know that people ask this question because they care. It is from the deepest part of their love and heart and their soul. They ask, what happened and what can we do about it? How can we start to try to change it? And when, I, when, I, when we saw the little kids coming up and bringing the pantry, what is our thoughts? Our thoughts, I hope and pray one day that they will always remain faithful to Christ in the church. And I, don't want to, I want us to be able to stop asking this question. What happened? You know, one of the things that we, uh, uh, when people mention what happened, these are some of the same things because people get confused and they ask what happened and they'll say, but this is what I did. I took my kids to church service. But my kids, they got baptized. My kids went to youth group and they went to church camp. When it came to school, they were more moral than the kids at school. And my family was always involved. And this has really been the recipe that we have actually tried to undertake when it comes to trying to save our families, especially our kids. Does this kind of sound like your family? Yeah. This is the majority of people when it comes to how we try to rear our children in the faith in Jesus Christ. And, and then... We, get, we ask the question, what happened? And we, we get confused because they're like, but they came to church every day, and then every Sunday, every Wednesday. They went into the water. They, they hung out with church kids. They spent a week at camp. They're better than other kids. My family wasn't like just apathetic church pew sitters. We were involved. What happened? And this question has plagued me because the latest statistics have been that 75 to 90 percent of kids who grew up attending church are now leaving Christ in the church. That's not acceptable to me. 
That is not acceptable to me. And so when I hear the question of what happened, that question nags me. Every single day, I try to answer this question. And I spent a lot of time researching generations, researching sociology, reading content by Christians and by secular people. I'm trying to understand the psychology, trying to see it from every analytical vantage point possible. And I know um, talking with our elders and our deacons and our ministry leaders, our youth and their salvation is one of our biggest priorities. And in fact, uh, months ago, we actually gathered all the elders and their wives, the deacons and their wives, ministry leaders and their wives, and we said, here's some things that we want to do. What are the priorities of the church? If we were asking, if we were a brand new church, what would we do? If we could only have a few ministries in the church because that's all the time and money and resources we had, what would be the focus? Do you know what came up? It was the youth and trying to save them. So I want us to know our church, our leadership, has a heart for the lost, especially with our kids, because we want them to be found by Christ and to remain in Christ and be faithful unto death in Christ. And this is one of the questions that our leadership is racking our minds on is, how can we develop faith within our kids in the next generation in an ever-increasing secular world? As I mentioned a few weeks ago, 40%, 40% of Americans today now claim to have no religious preference. Not just Christianity, just no religion in general. 40% of Americans so how, how do we raise godly children in an ungodly world? And why do we keep asking this question, what happened? And then so I thought about this, and I studied scripture. And I think part of it is we're going to have to make a psychological change in our minds. Because this is what we've done, and it doesn't work. Now, are these all good things? Yes, they are. Do I encourage you to do them all? Yes, I do. Do you think, I, I, I mean, to be honest, I think this is the minimum you should be doing. These aren't the high expectations. We think, oh, he goes to church and he got baptized and he goes to camp. Wow, really good team. No, that should be the minimum. So we're going to have to make a psychological change here. And I think maybe you even need to make a psychological change. And for me, I needed to make a psychological change because this is something that I've been thinking for years and years on how... I need to change. And in fact, Disney and I spent yesterday, a part of yesterday, talking about how we can do things in our own family to try to make sure that we raise our kids in the Lord so that they be faithful. And we sat down, we wrote down, we were coming up with ideas on how we can try to implement what, some of what we're talking about today. But I think to start out with, we have to make a philosophical change in our minds. A philosophical change. And what do I mean by that? One of the things that I think we have to do is we have to redefine salvation. I think we have to redefine it. I think because the way that we have defined salvation is, okay, they believe in Jesus, God baptized, go to church. Now, all, all three of those things are essential. Yes, they are. Do you have to be baptized? Yes, you do. Do you need to be part of the church? Yes, you do. Do you need to have faith in Jesus Christ? Yes, you do. I'm not negating any of that. So doctrinally, I'm not saying any of that. But we have kind of minimized the fullness of understanding what salvation is. And part of this is redefining it to understand that salvation has to philosophically mean we know God. You know, there's a meme going around on Facebook that kind of been spread around lately that says kids grow up in church learning hymns, but they didn't actually know him. And I think that's the core of why people fall away, at the essence of it. You know, we know that the greatest commands are to love God and love people, right? Do you know what's really interesting? The idea of love to the Greeks encompassed the idea to know. It's kind of like when, even in the biblical language about a love between a husband and a wife, and the love that a husband and wife have, as you see in scripture, and as you see in the Greek language, the word, the love between a husband and a wife, really means to know each other. To know each other on an intimate level, and not just 
in a physical way, but emotionally and spiritually. Like the whole being, to know them. And I think that's what we need to do with our kids and with our spouses and with people in our family is to understand we don't just know some things about God. We actually know God. Know God as a husband and a wife know each other. Just as Christ and the church. If your kids are going to be part of the church, they have to know Christ. That means to intimately love them with every aspect of your being which is the full, fully aligns with the greatest commandment. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. A part of that also, we should know. We should have this intimate relationship with God. We should know Him with all of our heart, soul, mind, and strength. I mean, if you look at kids, and looking about anyone who has fallen away, they knew about Jesus. They knew He died on the cross. They knew He died for the sins of the world. But did they actually know Him? That's the difference. And that's what I've come to understand about people who have fallen away. Because I've interviewed people who have fallen away. And people have been honest with me who have fallen away. They'll tell you. And one of the key things in my research, in my study, in my questioning of people who have left Christ in the church was they never truly came to understand Christ themselves. They knew their parents knew Jesus. They knew doctrines. Here's the thing. They knew the plan of salvation, but they didn't know the Savior. There's a difference there. Now, do they need to know the plan of salvation? I'm the first one to tell you doctrine matters. 1 Timothy 4.16 says, Know your life and doctrine closely and persevere in them, for in doing so you save yourself and your hearers. Doctrine is 100% essential. But doctrine apart from knowing God is meaningless. Do you remember 1 Corinthians 13? You can have all knowledge and fathom all mysteries, but if you do not have love, it doesn't matter. You, you, can, you can sacrifice your body to the flames. You can be a martyr and give everything to the poor. But if you do not have love, if you don't know, it doesn't matter. I think this is where the core of it goes. And, if, and I want you to look at these salvation statements. We're going to be looking at some salvation statements that are specifically made by Jesus. Because really, I think on the Day of Judgment, one of the questions on whether or not someone's going to go to heaven or hell is the question, did I know you? Did I know you? And did you know me? Because one of the things we're going to look at is Jesus and Paul are going to make... Really, the point, it's knowing God that is really the determining factor in whether or not you have salvation. It's not just you got baptized. Now, do you have to be baptized? Absolutely. If you knew who Jesus was and he is Lord, if he tells you to get baptized, you get baptized. Okay, we understand that. But it can, we can't minimize it anymore. We have to know God. Do your kids, do you, does your spouse, do you yourself love God and know God and intimately desire to know God. And is that how you define eternal life? Do you know how we've defined eternal life in the past? Going to heaven. That's the wrong. That's wrong, actually. I'm going to tell you that right now. Going to heaven is a byproduct of eternal life, which is knowing God first. The only reason why heaven is heaven is because God is there. If God wasn't there, heaven would not be heaven. Have you really thought about that before? So the whole point is, how can I know God better? How can I help my wife or husband know God better? How can I help my kids know God better? How can we as a church help the next generation of believers know God? To intimately, with all of their being, pursue God. More than a, a boyfriend or girlfriend, but to, more than a career, but to pursue him with every part of their being. To know the Bible because they don't want to know the Bible for the sake of knowing facts. They want to know the Bible because that is how we know the nature and the character and the heart and the mind of God. And so I want us to look at some passages. Uh. Can you flip that for me? Yeah. Okay, is it working now? Okay. As I read, just flip it for me. <laughs> Clicker's not working. Okay. John 17, verse 1 through 5. I want to see here how Jesus himself defines eternal life, okay? 
He does not say it's heaven. Okay? John 17, verse 1 to 5. It says, When Jesus had spoken these words, he lifted his eyes to heaven. This is the prayer in the garden before he gets, you know, when he dies. And said, Father, the hour has come. Glorify your Son, that the Son may glorify you, since you have given him authority over all flesh to give eternal life to all you have given him. Now look at verse 3. This is a key verse. And this is eternal life, that they know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. I glorified you on earth, having accomplished the work you gave me to do. And now, Father, glorify me in your own presence with the glory that I had with you before the world existed. So just looking at what Jesus said, how did Jesus define eternal life in verse 3? How did he define it? Knowing God. Knowing God. And this is eternal life. Definition. That they know you. An intimate, deep relationship. So much so where it's not this apathetic, I sit on a church pew on a Sunday, check my box, and then I get to go to heaven. That's not eternal life. Eternal life is like I'm pursuing you with all my being. That's how Jesus defined it. So when we're talking about redefining salvation, we've got to define it the way Jesus defined it. Look at how Matthew 7, we quote this passage all the time. Now, I want you to look at how Jesus makes known who is saved and how he's not saved. This is why I think the question on is, are we really going to know uh, who's going to be saved here? It's really on the basis of if you know God. And if you really know God, you're going to obey God too. This is where all of it comes together. But let's read Matthew 7, 21 through 23. Now, everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven. But the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven... On that day, many will say to me, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and cast out demons in your name and do mighty works in your name? And then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you workers of lawlessness. Think about this. What does Jesus say to the people who do not go to heaven? I never knew you. So Jesus in John 17 says... Eternal life is knowing God. Matthew chapter 7, the ones who are not going to heaven, he says, I don't know you. And in fact, the next passage right here, Paul says the same thing. In 2 Thessalonians, Paul is mentioning the return of Christ and how he's going to really mention hell. And in fact, the greatest definition of hell is found in 2 Thessalonians chapter 1. Because he talks about how hell is this everlasting destruction which means the suffering that we think of hell, but even greater, not being in the presence of God. Okay? Because if you're not in the presence of God, you can't know God. And so that's why hell is hell. So let's read verse 6, and then look at how those who he will punish. Now, verse 6, starting. God is just. He will pay back trouble to those who trouble you and give relief to you who are troubled, and to us as well. This will happen when the Lord Jesus is revealed from heaven in blazing fire with his powerful angels. And he will punish those who do not know God and do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus. They will be punished with everlasting destruction and shut out from the presence of the Lord, that's the hell, and from the glory of his might. On the day he comes to be glorified in his holy people and to be marveled at all among all those who have believed. This includes you because you believed our testimony to you. One more. Uh, so go back for one more. So look at that. Did you see that when Christ returns, his fire angels, eternal day of judgment's right there, do you see who he said he's going to punish? Those who do not know God. Do you see how the three salvation statements we have come across have really come to whether or not you know God? And it's not know about God. Most Americans know about God. Apathetic Christians know about God. Real Christians know God. It's like when you think about your family members. There's a difference between knowing about your relatives and actually knowing your relatives. This is why we have to redefine salvation. How, so the, the first question that we really need to ask if we're really trying to save our families is how can I get my kids to know God on an intimate, personal, deep relationship? And if they know God, all the rest of it will, matter, will follow. If they know who God is, they will obey Him. If they know God, they will love Him. 
If they know God, they will choose to be faithful to Him. Our key is to get back to getting people to know God in a biblical, scriptural way that makes them long for them. There's a difference between being in love with someone and just being around them. We want, to, our, we want people to love God. They have to know. Turn to the next one. And now this is one of the things. People say, well, how do we help people know God? This is why it's so important why Jesus came to this earth. Because we know the Father through knowing Jesus. Turn to the next passage. In John chapter 14, 6 through 11 says this. Jesus answered, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. If you really know me, you will know my Father as well. From now on, you do know him and have seen him. Philip said, Lord, show us the Father, and that will be enough for us. And Jesus answered, Don't you know me, Philip? Even after I've been among you such a long time, anyone who has seen me has seen the Father. How can you say, show us the Father? Don't you believe that I am in the Father and that the Father is in me? The words I say to you, I do not speak on my own authority. Rather, it is the Father living in me who is doing his work. Believe me when I say that I am in the Father and the Father is in me. Or at least believe on the evidence of the work themselves. So we know this another salvation comment here. Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and life. No one comes to the Father th except through me. That's a salvation statement. Now look at the salvation. After the salvation statement, what did he make known? He made known that we know the Father by knowing who? Jesus. We know the Father by knowing Jesus. So our goal is, where well, we want people to know God. Well, how do I help them know God? Well, I've got to help them know Jesus. And so logically, I say, okay, how do I help them know Jesus? Is it my own opinion? Is it my own feelings? Is it my own thoughts? This is why the Word of God, and this whole year we've been talking about the theme of the Word of God. Why the Word of God is so important? Because we know Jesus through the Word. This is why we need to get our kids in the Word. Yesterday, Disney and I were asking ourselves, how can we implement more scripture into our home, into our kids? How can we implement it into our own individual lives? How can we implement it into our marriage better? How can we do this so that I know God better, Disney knows God better, Paige and Ace will know God better, Center Road will know God better, and then Kokomo will know God better, and then the world will know God better? I mean, if you ask yourself, how do you know about Jesus? How do you know Jesus? We know God exists. We know Jesus is the creator. We look outside. But how do we actually know what Jesus said? Where do you go to if you want to know what Jesus said? The Bible. How do you know what Jesus did? The Bible. How do we know the character and nature of Jesus? The Bible. This is why, why we try to emphasize, you know, we don't want you to come to Bible class for the sake of going to a Bible class. We want you to know God. This is why we don't just tell you to read your Bibles every day so you feel like I'm a little bit more religious and help, help me get me through my day. We want you to know God. Knowing God is the first thing and all the blood, spiritual blessings trickle down from that. Everything trickles down from that relationship with God. And so how do I know about Jesus? Here's the interesting thing. If you ever ask Richard Dawkins or any other atheist, they'll say Jesus is a good man and a good teacher. Did you know they'll say that? And then you, it's interesting, and then you say, okay, Captain Atheists, Ray, Richard, and, and so forth, how do you know Jesus is a good teacher? How do you know what he taught? They say, the Bible. Oh, you, you said Jesus is, has great moral character. Uh, where did you get that information? Do you know what they say? The Bible. And it's like, you atheists even admit that the Bible is credible and exemplifying the character, the nature, and the teachings, and the life of Jesus Christ. So even the atheists are admitting the power of the Word of God to exemplify who Jesus is. And so, if we need to know God to be saved, and the way that God helped us to know Him in order to be saved is to by sending Jesus, which we know Jesus is the source of our salvation, well, how do we know Jesus? Did you know all of the Bible from Genesis to Revelation is all about Jesus? You know, the Old Testament says he's coming. The Gospel says he's here. And the New Testament says he's coming again. 
every part of the Bible that the Holy Spirit inspired the men to write is all about Jesus. And in fact, Jesus says this. Turn to the next passage. John chapter 5, verse 39 through 47. He says, You search the scriptures because you think that in them you have eternal life. And it is they, and it is they that bear witness about me. This is what Jesus is saying. Yet you refuse to come to me that you may have life. See, another eternal eternity statement, another salvation statement. I do not receive glory from people, but I know that you do not have the love of God within you. See, the statement, loving God. He doesn't know that you don't know God. You, he knows that you don't have the love for him. And so he's emphasizing this idea, this salvation. He's making another salvation set of statements. Now let's continue on verse 43. I have come in my Father's name, and you do not receive me. If another comes in his own name, you will receive him. How can you believe when you receive glory from one another and do not seek the glory that comes from the only God? Do not think that I will accuse you to the Father. There is one who accuses you, Moses, on whom you have set your hope. For if you believed Moses, you would believe me. Look at why. Where they were putting their hope was in Moses, their salvation, their, their studying scriptures. For he wrote of me. But if you do not believe his writings, how will you believe my words? So Jesus is even making the point, you're looking for salvation, and you're looking for hope through the Old Testament, through the law of Moses. But do you not realize that Moses was talking about Jesus? And Jesus is the one who's directing you to the Father. And those who know the Father are the ones who are saved. Do you see how we need to start making a philosophical change in our minds? We need to stop saying eternal life is about going to heaven and avoiding hell. Eternal life is saying, I love God the Father through Jesus Christ, whom I know through God's holy word. This is why I want every person here to study God's Word on a daily basis. This is why I encourage life groups and Bible study and coming to worship services and home Bible studies with your family. Why? Because I don't want anyone to say, what happened? What happened? Did you see the solution that we have for our kids? The first thing on that list should say, no God. And encourage an intimate, deep, relationship with God where they actually know Him, know about Him, and love Him so much so that they would be really willing to obey Him, worship Him, commit Him, uh, commit to Him, serve Him. Why? Because they know Him. And why would they be faithful to Him? They know His character. They know His promises. And there is no one that they would rather love more than God. Everything has to start with the first thing, the most important thing. And that is to know God. If you do not know God, you sitting here today does not matter. If you do not know God, the money put in the collection plate does not matter. If you do not know God, then being slightly more moral than the people at work or at school does not matter. I want every single person in this church building, in our church family, and all your kids to go and know God. Why? Because that is eternal life. If we're truly trying to save our families, we got to change how we do this. And all of us have to be on board. Your kids matter to me. I hope my kids matter to you. I hope you who are older care about the next generation of believers and the example you said. Are you helping them see an example of what it means to know God? To love God, not just be comfortable sitting on a pew, checking a box, saying, I got baptized, I go to church service, and I'm slightly better than the, my neighbor. That's not eternal life. That is not how Jesus defined it. He defined it by saying, eternal life is this, to know you, God. And guess what? It's not why heaven is heaven. Because of God. If I asked you, would you be satisfied of avoiding all pain by having heaven void of God, would you be satisfied? If the answer is yes, you, you don't understand eternal life.
today I want every person here to be committed to knowing God. Do you know his promises? Do you know his word? Do you know his nature and his character? Do you know his sacrifices? Do you know his teachings? Are you committing yourself to knowing God? Are you, are you committed to encouraging other people to know God? That's why your presence at worship matters and Bible class and life groups, your family Bible studies, why they all matter. Not to feel more religious and spiritual, though religion isn't bad because it just means paying homage to the one who is worthy of it. But it's to say, I intimately want to know God on a deeper level and love him. And that's it. And everything else will resort from that first fact. And I want my kids to know God. And if, I, if they will truly, truly know God, they'll do the right moral things. They'll obey God. They'll do all the things that the Bible says. But we've got to make the first thing first. The first thing first isn't, okay, follow the list of things that we've done where 75 to 90% of our kids are leaving. And if you ask those 75 to 90% of people who have left, if you ask them, do you really, really know God? Do you really know who He is? Do you really know that God is God and that He loves you and that He's your Savior? I can tell you right now, those 79, 75 to 90 people say, I don't really know God. That's the difference maker. So church, maybe you need to know God better. Maybe today you've been saying, you know, I've been just sitting on a pew... I want to know you. And maybe you're saying, well, I want my kids to go to heaven, or my grandkids to go to heaven, or my nieces and nephews to go to heaven. What can I do? I will show them the greatest example of knowing God, and loving God, and obeying God, and worshiping God, because we understand who God is, because we know Him. Only then will we have an opportunity to truly save our families. If today you want to know God and you know that God is both Lord and Christ and that through Jesus Christ who had died, buried, and rose again and opened up the opportunity for you to have a relationship with God which is salvation then when Tom comes up here to lead our song of encouragement and invitation we encourage you to come forward and if you need us to pray for you and encourage you and help you grow in your walk with Christ because maybe you have said, I really don't know God, but I've been just doing the basic things of Christianity. Pull one of the elders aside, pull me aside, and let us encourage you, pray for you, and help you come up with a plan to really know God. But we give you that invitation now as we stand and sing. Since the love of God has shed priceless blessings on my head, I have made. It shall rule the love of God in the heart will kindly warmth in part the soul will blow and raise in a tender mercy in the Lord the love of God looks like a flame to endless years is the same the love of God will never ever let me glory till he embraced to face he who gave his love to me that I might from sin be free bids me share
seated. Thank you, Micah, for that wonderful challenge this morning to know God better. Carrie? 